And, uh, yo, I tell you, my heart breaks for, for people, but especially for, you know, our young people. Uh, some of our teenagers, yo, they are struggling. We have, we have teenagers who are, this last season, who, who have been suicidal, depressed, anxious, panic attacks, freaking out. And I know some of our adults as well, you know, life happens. And so we are passionate about creating an environment where people can encounter God. So we're doing this series called Honorable. And today I want to answer this question. Will we be a desolate house or will we be a life-giving house? As a church or your home, your environments, will it be a life-giving house, home, or will it be, a, will it be desolate, meaning spiritually dead and I'm sure we all want life-giving environments, eh? So they, you see, God mostly works through, I said it last week, God mostly works through people. Come on, say people. A lot of people get this wrong, especially in Western society. We like, I can do this on my own. Well, I'm going to show you. No, you can't. So there are people that uh, um, might be at home like today. Not here. Not watching online. They're at home. And they're like crying out to Jesus. God, where are you? I'm anxious. I'm struggling. I'm hopeless. I am I don't know what to do, God. I don't know which way to go, God. Why aren't you answering my prayers? And then God's response would be something along these lines. I love you. I heard your prayers. And I sent you the answer to your prayers. It's coming through a person. So here's an image of a courier. It's coming. Put on the image. I am not seeing my image. Why am I not seeing my image? Yay. Okay, so you ordered the take a lot and you were like, God, I desire this. And I'm filling up your basket. And you're like, come on, I'm going to this. I'm excited. And then the courier shows up at the door at some point And you're like, ooh, no, I don't like this courier. You, sh you slam the door and, and the courier goes away and you don't receive your gift. So in the same way, it's like we are praying to the Lord and we say, God, I'm praying for that peace. I'm praying for that breakthrough. I'm praying for, that, for, 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 for the answer. And then God answers it. I heard you. I love you. But the, the courier came to Shofar East London Church this morning and you were at home. And you missed out. Or the courier address was at Life Group. And your answer, your prayer, your breakthrough would have happened there through somebody else. But you were like, no, I'm going to get straight from Jesus. You don't understand the kingdom. You don't understand how the kingdom works. God mostly works through people. And usually through people that sometimes freak you out. People that are messy, people that don't look like you would want them to look, and then God answers you through that person. As I said last week, you're asking God for direction, and then your parent tells you something like, no, I don't want to hear from them. Or your spouse tells you, next morning your wife tells you, hey, this is what you must do. Like, no, I want it straight from Jesus. No, God works through people. Come on, say people. He works through people. That's why community is so powerful. But in Western society, we think, I have my Bible, and so I have Jesus and everything sorted. Well, you might be saved and you might make heaven, but you're not going to flourish. Because God works through people. He gives gifts to people. The courier comes and he has the package. He's like, I will not have couriers. I don't want straight. No, you're not going to get straight from God. Okay, so it's so important to understand that. 
I mean, and, and we see this. So, so, so the power of honor is to value what somebody carries, to value what somebody brings to the table. So, for instance, you can go back to the previous slide. So, you need to value what someone carries. So, so the basic example, I'm going to recap from last week. So, Jesus, the Son of God, who carries all the treasures of God upon his life, he goes to his hometown. And what happens? The people look at him like, who are you? Who do you think you are? So they get offended with him and they're like, no, we're not going to receive from you. And it says there, he could not do a mighty work in that place. He could not. Come on, say could not. He could not. He could not. It was the will of God to bless them. He was the courier. He was the messenger. He was bringing the package. He was bringing healing and deliverance and freedom and, and everything, peace and joy and salvation. He was bringing it to them. I mean, he's God in the flesh. And it says he could not do a mighty work there. He could not. So what if the reason that many environments that we find ourselves in is like, where is God? Because it's like, he cannot do a mighty work. He cannot do a mighty work in your work environment because of all the dishonor in the place. He cannot do a mighty work in your home environment because of the dishonor in the relationships. He cannot do a mighty work in your school or wherever, your environment, because of, unfortunately, our culture has been infused with dishonor, backbiting, criticism, negativity, cynicism, unbelief, doubts, and whatever else. And the result is, God's like, I want to. I want, it's my will to bless you. But unless this thing shifts, you're not going to receive the package. You're not going to receive the gift. You need to get this. Because <laughs> a lot of people are like, well, it's probably not God's will. I tell you, the will of God is not the issue. The will of God is not the issue. He wants to show up mightily. But there's something we need to catch. We need to catch this heavenly value called honor. Come on, say honor. Honor. So life flows through honor. The life of God flows through people when we honor them. That's how it flows. That's the kingdom mechanism. And I'll explain in a moment why. There's such a powerful quote concerning honor. It says, honor is to celebrate who someone is without stumbling over who they're not. Honor is to celebrate who someone is. In other words, what they carry on their life without stumbling over who they're not. You see, we as people, our flesh, our humanity, we are gifted at seeing what is wrong. We are gifted at getting offended about nothing. We are gifted at seeing what, who somebody is not. And they, I'm, I'm not going to receive from you. And again, your prayer has been answered. God loves you. It is the will of God to bless you. And then you can't receive it because of the skepticism, negativity, unbelief in your own heart. And so I want to, today, I want to I give us a few, I unpack a little bit further the whole topic of honor and, and show you some obstacles to honor. Okay, so let's remove some of those obstacles so that we can receive the gift of God. Come on, say this with me. I'm going to receive the gift of God. Okay. That's it. You're going you're gonna to get this. Some of us are offended with God when it's actually something that needs to shift in our own hearts. It's not working because something needs to change in you. Okay? And ultimately, that means you are a powerful person. It's not the people. It's not your environment. It's actually something that needs to shift on the inside. So come on, say this with me. It's going to shift. It's going to shift. Amen. Let me pray and we'll unpack it. Father, we thank you that your word is powerful. Your word will not return void. And I pray, God, that this morning, that, that whatever needs to shift on the inside of us, God, may it shift. May we see with the eyes of heaven in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so let's build out environments of honor where God can work mightily. So recap, Matthew 23. I ended last week with this verse. 
verse 37. It says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This is Jesus speaking. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Ay, ay, ay. This is the city of God, the city of David. The people of God so infused with the culture of dishonor that they kill those who are sent to help. They kill. That is unfortunate what religion does. Dead religion. If you've been born again, saved for longer than three weeks, there's this temptation to become religious, dead religion. It says, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers a brood under her wings and you were not willing? So in other words, here I am, I'm bringing the gifts, I'm bringing the blessings, but you weren't willing because you didn't understand honor. Then it says, verse 38, see your house is left to you desolate. That's the result of dishonor. Our homes become spiritually desolate. Our lives become dry and dreary and powerless because of a lack of honor. See, your house is left to you desolate. Come on, say desolate. You don't want this. You don't want this. This is what happens because of dead religion. This is what happens because of dead religion. You, you have the principles, you've heard the stories, but the heart isn't right. The heart isn't hungry for God. Verse 39, for I tell you, you will not see me again. This is Jesus, huh? Say, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus saying, you will not see me again until you can celebrate and honor those whom I send to you. And that's unfortunately what happened to Jerusalem. So a dishonoring culture, a, a, a people who became religious, but they didn't have the eyes to see the messenger of God. So then God sends John the Baptist this crazy, wild, locust-eating guy in the wilderness. And the Pharisees are like, that, guy, that guy's nuts. I'm not going to receive from him. Then Jesus appears, and he's like, you know, this, spends time with the sinners and the prostitutes and the tax collectors. And they're like, ew, that is just terrible. And the sinners like him. No. So they don't receive from him. And then at the beginning, when Jesus was born, then you have an old guy called Simeon and he see, walks into the temple and he discerns in his heart that baby Jesus is the Messiah. Can you imagine that? And then he celebrates the baby. He says, oh God, you've answered our prayers. How did he know that? Because he saw with the eyes of his heart. He could see a baby being the Messiah when the race couldn't see Jesus and all the, and doing the miracles, I mean, they couldn't see. They couldn't see the messenger of the Lord. So God will often send us people that just don't look like we want them to look like. And I, and I believe one of the main reasons why we often miss the messenger of the Lord is because of fear. Fear. The Pharisees, fear set in. They were afraid of losing their influence. They were afraid of losing their followers. They were afraid of, 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 of being defiled. That things aren't perfectly correct like the way we want it. And so... They missed Jesus, tried to control the, 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 the messengers, tried to kill them. So what does fear look like? It looks like COVID season. It looks like the last two years. That's what fear looks like. Okay, COVID on the scene, people are dying. And what happens? People freak out. We're terrified, terrified. We're terrified, and so it's like, oh, so now we're like there's fighting happening this way and that way because we are afraid. You see, when you become afraid, then you become stupid. That's the truth. I become stupid when I am afraid, when my walls are up, when I'm like, I'm, like, I'm not myself. I'm not loving others. I am freaking out. Fear looks like you see your shadow and you're like, ah, and you run. Everybody else thinking, well, what's going on with you? You're acting stupid. They're like, oh, I saw my shadow. It's It's fear. So we had COVID, and then we had, praise Jesus, conspiracy theories, and online social media and fear-mongering, and that just amplified it. Next level. And then, how did we Christians handle it? Terribly. 
the last two years, last season's better, but before that, I mean, I had more fights with believers or from believers than, than, than previous 20 years of ministry. Most church leaders will tell, we got weird. We are freaking out about masks. We're freaking out about not having masks. We're freaking out about vaccines or not having vaccines. It is the end. I told you guys, it's not the end. But some people didn't want to listen. It's 5G. Oh, causing COVID. What do we do? We burn down 5G towers. It wasn't the towers. We go stupid. We go weird. I mean, I remember the one guy, you know, he was like, you're sending your people to hell. For what? For like, I think vaccines are okay. I'm like, guy, whoa, stop the bus. Stop the bus. Can we disagree and still be gracious? <laughs> Can we disagree and still value one another? But we be, when fear kicks in, then we begin to demonize. You're the enemy. Uh, what if we don't have enemies? Because we're so secure in the love of God. Mm, that's a brilliant thought. Uh, what, if, what if you and I would just, we did choose not to have enemies in our lives because we are not afraid because God is with us. Our names are anchored. We, our names are written in the book of life. If you're a believer in Jesus, if you die, you just get upgraded to heaven. I promise you, if we all could experience heaven right now, we would all say, cheers guys, I wanna go. <laughs> it's amazing. Believers are not afraid of death. And if we're not afraid of death, how can we fear anything or anyone? We don't. Fear makes us weird. So I want to encourage us. Next time when fear comes, stop the bus and pray and deal with that root fear and then choose to be loving and honoring towards others. Amen. Come on, say it. I'm not going to be afraid. Amen. It was the most insane season. I, I wish like, will we never forget that? Never forget that. The Antichrist didn't come. We're not all dead. <laughs> Let's get back onto the page. Let's do the Great Commission. Let's see Jesus' kingdom come. Dishonor, dishonor, honor works based in disagreement. Honor works best where there is disagreement. In other words, we can disagree, but we can still speak nicely to one another. We can still be gracious. We can still be honoring. Okay? Married couples. Just remember this. Remember this moment. We don't need to scream. We don't need to shout. We don't need to be afraid. We can value. We can be gracious. We can love one another. Honor works best with this disagreement. That is what God wants for us. God's ways are not man's ways. I mean, imagine this for a moment. You're in Cape Town. A 30-year-old shows up preaching there somewhere. And uh, let's say you're a church leader and you're trying to figure out what's happening. And she's like, uh, you hear about this? And, and he's preaching a little bit different than the usual message. And you're like, so where, where is he from? And they say, no, from East London. Oh, I think good comes from East London. That's already, you're like, oh. oh, oh. Then you're like, okay, what denomination is he from? Uh, well, he's unaffiliated. No. So he's not in my denomination. He's not in my church group. Oh, you, you, where did he study his theology? He's actually uneducated. He's been in the construction industry for most of his adult life. And you're like, oh, now I'm really getting worried. And then you get a sound bite of one of his messages. And you're like, I don't think the scriptures actually say that. And then they say there's miracles happening and things like that. And some of your church members go over there. And now you are absolutely freaking out. Must be the devil. Start warning everybody. Guys, stay away. Eh? And what's his name? Jesus. 30-year-old <laughs> from Nazareth. Sort of in the construction industry. <laughs> and he shows up, young man, preaching a different message. So-called miracles. What did the Pharisees do? It's the devil. Why? Because we're so afraid. So afraid, so afraid. And immediately we start to criticize, find fault, reject. Why? Fear. Guys, believers should not be afraid. 
We should not be afraid. I mean, that verse where it says in, 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 in Jerusalem, Jerusalem says, you were not willing. The, 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 another translation says, um, you were too stubborn. Too stubborn. Sometimes it's our pride that keeps us from receiving from the Lord. I will do this myself. No, you won't. <laughs> You're going to struggle. That's part of the kingdom. God is looking for a humble, hungry people that will move us beyond our own ideas and say, God, I really need community. I really need to receive the gifts on people's lives. And Lord, I really, really, really need to receive the gift on, 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 on another denomination's, um, on their lives. Somebody that's outside our church group. God, I need to receive that. If we don't, the result is, as Jesus said, that your house is left to you desolate. So Jerusalem was destroyed, 70, 80, absolutely destroyed to the ground. The temple was destroyed. That is a picture of a desolate house. A picture of a desolate house. A picture where God is not. Why? Because we were stubborn. My way. Guys, God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. We need the... the Eyes like Simeon had to discern what is on somebody's life. God loves to send people that it doesn't fit the mold. Like sometimes God might actually send a woman. No, not a woman, Lord. A man must preach the word. Well, maybe the man wasn't willing. So Jesus chose a woman or a young person because the old people didn't want to go. Or maybe choose an old person because the young people didn't want to go. Whatever it is, God is calling people to go, to step out. And then we get hung up. We get uptight about people's stuff and the messiness. It's like, oh, my soul, that person is divorced. <whistles> no, God, that's just wrong. God loves to do wrong. In that sense, he likes to break our molds. He loves to use imperfect people to do his will. Amen. I mean, look at the scriptures. If we would say, I will only receive from perfect people. Chuck the Bible. Eh? It's all imp imperfect people, all messy. Peter was messy. Paul was messy. Everybody was messy except Jesus. He just came and made it messy at times. You know, so why would he do this? Because God is looking for humility. Perfection is not the qualifying factor. He's looking for a humble people that can see with the eyes of their hearts. And so with Sonica, so many times, I've, you know, about six, seven, eight years ago, we were in a prayer meeting and, I, and, and, and some, I know, someone or I, but somebody had a word that saw Sonica with a key in her hands, a key. And we felt the Lord say, she is the key to this church to move us forward. I've had other words about her, uh, of, 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 she's a key ingredient to the whole fivefold ministry because of a relational a gift that she brings to the table. She's going to bring longevity to the fivefold. In other words, her passion for relationship means that it will be not just one generation, but it will be one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. Come on, can we see what somebody carries, even if they are different to us? So the opposite of stubbornness is I'm looking for humility and hunger. That's what God is saying. Then he said, you will not see me again, Jesus said, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That, that person might be your spouse. That person might be somebody in life group. That person might be someone in your environment that is just a little bit different. And then he says, until you say, come on, say it, say. He said, un un unless you say, blessed is he or she who comes in the name of the Lord. Until you say it, that speaks of celebration. That speaks of not just, well, I'm not going to be negative today. No, I'm not going to be just neutral. I'm not going to think negative things. No, I am so excited to receive from my brother or sister in Christ. Blessed is he. Come on, let's say it. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That means celebrate. Honor is a heart attitude that celebrates in our words and actions. Like Simeon coming into the temple and he's saying, 
Praise God, here is the long-awaited Messiah. Instead of being critical, instead of finding fault, instead of ungodly judgment, instead of, of all, all the negatives, God is looking for humility. Till you say, I'm sure none of us want, none of us want a desolate house. So you and I, we are called to love others. I tell you, but as I said, when I'm afraid, defenses are up, I struggle to love when I'm afraid or offended. And there's the same with you. Fear does something terrible to the human heart. Fear does something terrible to the human heart. We can't honor well when we are afraid. So life flows through honor, but fear blocks the flow of honor. Here's the quote, put it on there. Life flows through honor, but fear blocks Fear blocks the flow of honor. So what if you and I could be so secure, so secure in the love of God that we don't allow fear into our lives when we relate to people? Now, do you think that's possible? I, I believe it is. I mean, God is challenging me on this. Even though I have people in my environments that might not agree with me theologically in the past, my defenses were up and I'm going to defend myself and I'm going to fight with you about theology. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm like, God is saying, no, stop it. Stop being defensive. I will fight for you. Stop being on the back foot. You're acting like an idiot. Stop it. <laughs> You're misrepresenting me. You're not being loving. You're not being gracious. You're not being kind. You're not being who I call, I'm calling. You are misrepresenting me when you allow fear and defense to be in your life. What if you and I could be unafraid? And, if, and we can only be unafraid when we understand the love of God. So look at this, 1 John 4, 17. It says, and as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. As we live in God, there's a maturity, there's a love that increases. Our love grows more perfect, more mature. So we will not be afraid. Come on, say, not be afraid. Not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face Him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. So think about this. The day of judgment is the most scary, fear, fearsome, terrible day in all of eternity of the time and eternity, the day where God's wrath is poured out upon unbelievers, those who don't have a living relationship with Jesus. It's a terrible day. And he says, if we know his love, then we will not be afraid on that day. So if we're not afraid on that day, because we know him, he's our dad and he loves us. If we're not on that day, not afraid on that day, why would we be afraid on any other day? Why would we be afraid when people are being silly? Why would we be afraid of people that may be uh, negative towards us? Why would we be afraid of the future? There shouldn't be any day that we are afraid. Because we're in Him. It says there. We will not be afraid on the day of judgment. Ultimately, because we live like Jesus here in this world. Like Jesus. We're like Jesus. Jesus wasn't afraid. Jesus wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid of the Pharisees and he wasn't afraid of the sinners. He was not afraid of sin. He wasn't afraid of others. He could confidently and boldly go on doing the work of God. Verse 18, such love has no fear. Come on, say no fear. No fear. Because perfect love expels all fear. Perfect love expels all, all fear. When you encounter the love of God, you become unafraid. You become unafraid of conflict. You become unafraid of people that are different. You become unafraid of being contaminated by people whose lives might be messy. It says, if we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced His perfect love. We've not fully experienced his perfect love. I'm like, God, I want to love everybody. I want to love everybody. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter how different they are or what denomination or different theology, whatever. We might not agree, but I'm not afraid of you. I can be gracious towards you. I can love you well. Because what happens when someone is different or believes differently? What happens? We do cancel culture. 
you don't exist anymore. Be gone. Not very loving, huh? But this is the new thing, huh? Cancel culture. But perfect love expels all fear. What if you and I could stop demonizing those who think or believe differently? Imagine modern day Christians walking into heaven. And you want to worship Jesus and you look over there and you go, there's a Presbyterian in heaven and a Baptist and an old apostolic and a Roman Catholic. Oh, my soul. And then I'm sure somebody would pick up like this, this, this sign, like Presbyterians over here, Baptists over here, crazy charismatics, please, over there. Just, just, just go over there. <laughs> Divide. Divisions, because we don't believe the same. I tell you, in every church group on the planet, there are some genuine, true believers who love Jesus. Every church, every church group. And in every church across the planet, there are some who do not know Jesus, and they go to that church. Every church, people here today, possibly don't have a living relationship with Jesus. But oh, that 5%, we believe differently. We like baptism. <gasps> you don't see baptism like I do. It's okay, let's disagree, but I love you, man. Follow Jesus. I love you. What if we could be honorable? I received this, uh, we received this message from a Ukrainian pastor in the war uh, in, 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 in the Ukraine. And he says, He's in Kiev, and he says, a, a, a lot of believers have left. The churches are empty. There are very few ministers, but at the same time, the boundaries between churches and denominations are erased. I pastor a church of the full gospel. Usually, I am not invited to preach in the Baptist churches, but now it is different. <laughs> That's the power of war. You're like, just get over your nonsense. <laughs> Get over the nonsense. So there's a minor theological difference. No, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to be together in heaven. How about heaven drawing near now and we actually love one another even though we're different? Amen. There's a passage in John chapter 17 where Jesus prays his prayer. He says, Lord, make them one. Why? So that the world may believe in me. Currently, we're not very one because we get hung up on the minor differences. And then we be, because of the fear and things that hold us back. Come on, let's bring honor back to the game. So quickly, obstacles to honor, ending off with this. Number one, we reject others because we're afraid of bad doctrine. So whose doctrine is perfect? You don't believe like I believe, so I reject all of you. That's immaturity. Your doctrine's going to change over the next five years. My doctrine's going to change. I will hopefully become better, more mature in Christ over the next five to ten years. And so will you. So, so to say it needs to be perfectly the same to be able to receive from somebody is a massive mistake. So here's a powerful quote by a, a German Lutheran theologian whose name is interesting. Rupertus Meldinius. He says, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. That is honor. In all things, charity. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. So what would be the essentials? It would be like the Apostles' Creed would be some of the essentials. It says, this comes from 300 after Christ. Most churches across the planet believes this. It says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit and in the Holy Catholic Church. <laughs> Now, guys, Catholic means universal church, okay? So breathe. The holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
That speaks to me of a confidence of who we are in God. Your name written in the book of life. We are not afraid. But what happens is at times we take the essentials and we expand it. It's like the essentials is now is, 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 uh, is everything. So you believe a little bit different in one area, so we can't walk together. No, we agree on the essentials and there's liberty in the non-essentials. There's a classic saying that says, eat the meat, spit out the bones. That's how we all eat. There's a lot of people missing out on T-bone steak right now in the kingdom of God. Because like I see that bone, go away. I'm like, brother, bring it. I'll eat the meat that like, like, como uh, du nom. No, I'm not afraid of you because there's a bone in what you, sp- because I don't agree with everything you said. I'm going to eat my, come on, I'm going to eat my, I'm going to eat my T-bone. I'm going to eat my T-bone. Come on. Huh? Love empowers us to be honoring. I can see what's on your life. Although I don't agree with everything, but I can see what's on your life. So I'm going to receive the gift that you carry on your life. Honor is to celebrate who someone is without stumbling over who they're not. And then the second reason why we have a massive obstacle to honor is we reject others because we're afraid of their sin. So who's perfect? Who's perfect? Anybody? But we're so, so, so often so afraid. In the Old Testament, it was all about containing sin. So when we bring this Old Testament mindset into the New Testament, we are terrified of sin. We're terrified of evil and we are terrified of sin. And that makes us weird. So Old Testament, if, you, if, 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 a, uh, if a leper touched you, you would be unclean. Eh? New Testament, Jesus touches the leper. What happens? The leper becomes clean. That's confidence. That's New Testament confidence. We're not afraid of sin. Jesus paid the price at the cross. He dealt with the power of sin. That's confidence. No, I'm not afraid of other people's messiness. I'm not afraid. And some of we're afraid of evil. So we're like, ooh, the Satanists. We're so scared. I love the testimony by uh, Graham Cook. As as I understand the story, more than 300 occultists has been led to Christ through him. And he says the one time he was sitting on an airplane and the Satanist sits next to him and the Satan says, I have been sent to curse you. How would you respond? (laughs) Stewardess, I want to sit somewhere else. How does he respond? He's like, whoa, 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 that's Awesome, hold on, I want to get my notebook, I want to write this down. So he gets up, takes his notebook out, and he says, okay, I'm ready, let's go. And he's like, "Uh, uh uh-huh, he writes it down, "Uh, uh-uh, yes, yes, say that again, Uh, oh, how do you spell that? Okay, Um, and he's writing down everything the Satan is like cursing him. And at some point off, he's written everything down, he looks at the guy and says, how long have you been doing this? No, I mean, Satan's like 20 years, he says, well, you're not very good at it. I was expecting something really meaty, something really good, and this is just really lame. <laughs> In the end, he says the Satanist got so freaked out, he got up and the Satanist went to sit somewhere else because Graham Cook freaked him out. Because you see, Graham understands his position in Christ. He understands that when Jesus died at the cross, he overcame all evil at the cross, all sin. There is no fear in Christ. And he knows that whatever the enemy sends to him, God will turn it for something good. So what he does is he writes down what, the, what he's cursed with. And then he says, okay, God, the enemy's saying this. What are you saying? And then he writes that down. And he gets a prophecy from the heart of his heavenly father. If you're cursing me, God is saying you are blessed. If you're saying you have fear, then God is saying you have peace. If you're saying you're going to die an early death, it's like, man, you're, you're going to have a long life in me. Amen. That's powerful. That's freedom. What if you and I would not be, you know, not be so terrified? It's like the, you know, the, and the de- decades previously, and I don't know if you guys remember, it was like the Ninja Turtle time. And everybody's freaking out. Mutant Ninja Turtles, burn it! Burn it! Our kids are all going to go to hell. No, man. 
It's just Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Is the enemy really that powerful? What if we would teach our children how powerful they are in Christ? What if they would discover that there is no fear in Jesus? What if they would discover that what Jesus has done for us at the cross? Then there is no fear. So come on, say it. There is no fear in Christ. Amen. This is a culture of honor. We understand what Jesus has done. We live from that place. And if you live from that place, you can look at the occultist or the Satans, whatever, you can love them. And you just say, okay, you have some issues, but I love you. Jesus loves you. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be intimidated. And they say that the Christian army is the only army in the world. I hear the Russians do it also, but they kill their own wounded. Kill their own wounded. Why? Because there's a preacher that you love. You listen to them, reading their books, and then there's moral failure. They got taken out in the, in the war. What do we do? Cancel culture. Ooh, everything's bad. No, maybe they still have something beautiful to give, something beautiful to share, even if there is something that's not, not perfect. So who is perfect? Who doesn't sin at all or make no mistakes? Whose doctrine is perfect? No, no one. A better question would be, what gift do they bring? And let's receive that. Amen. No, I'm shaking our thinking a little bit today, huh? Praise God. Please stand with me. But so what will our homes look like? Will it be desolate? Will we be too stubborn to position ourselves in a place where we can receive the gift of God from somebody? Will we forget that God mostly works through people? Or will we have an honoring attitude, an honoring heart to receive from others who might look different and believe a little bit differently. So what will our homes be, look like? What will your home look like? What will this church be like? A life-giving house? Or a desolate house? Last verse I want to read, 1 John 4, 19. Why can we love? Why can we love well? We love because He first loved us. You remember? He loved you while you were messy. Maybe some of us are still messy today. It's okay. But He loved you. He loved you. He loved us. We love because He first loved us. I'm seeing a church filled with the love of Jesus, unafraid. I'm seeing a church that can honor the wider body of Christ in this city and wider because we're not afraid of other people's messiness. I see a, a people who can love others even if they don't like us because that's what Jesus did when we didn't like him so much. Amen. Come on, say it. I'm going to love well. Come on. No more fear. Don't be fear-driven. Don't be moved by fear. Don't, be, don't, don't go there. Allow the love of God to love you and to love through you. Life flows through honor. Fear blocks the flow of honor. I'm going to say, man, I'm going I'm to love well. Doesn't matter who it is. Messy, immoral, occultist, aggressively anti, enemy, me, no, what? No, we don't have enemies. We're just going to love people. God Almighty, we worship you.